Lord, we thank you so much for gathering your family together tonight. Because your love draws us to yourself. And Jesus, you said, if you be lifted up, you'll draw all men to yourself. May you glorify yourself again tonight as we draw together to sit under your feet to listen to your voice. What a wonderful God you are. What a marvelous redeemer you are. What a faithful friend you are. Be glorified, Lord, indeed, that the leadership of this cathedral has been raised by you for a reason. And for that reason, Lord, will you enable them and empower them to raise your church to the level where you want them to be in their time. And for each one of us, open our hearts. Help us to connect with you. Open our ears to listen to you. And open our eyes to behold the wonders of your word. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray in the church say, Amen. 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 First, Mama Phoebe prayed for me as I was coming here because two are better than one. Let me start with the testimony because this is a very powerful topic we are dealing with tonight. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, you can feel the rest yourself. But let me start with the testimony. I came to Christ at the age of 18. I was a rebel because my background was so full of dubious spirits. My, my grandfather had 12 demons in our village, and I was very interested in them. So the day Jesus met me at night, he released me and he set me free, and I went to bed. <laughs> Having not slept for three nights, I slept so soundly. That began my journey. But there was yet another package God wanted me to receive because as I walked with him, as I memorized the scripture, as I hungered for him, then there was a time he gave me a wife. And this was 1972, exactly five years after I had given my life to Jesus Christ. The very next week from my wedding, my wife and I encountered the power of the Spirit in a dramatic way. It was like God wanted us to be together before he could release his very powerful high voltage power. And when I came to meet him in that way, one of the benefits I can tell you now is that he held our marriage for the last 51 years together. We are still running strong, and we'll continue running strong. I'm an Anglican, born and bred an Anglican. But the Spirit of God, when he arrests an Anglican who understands order and who knows sequence, there's no confusion. That is the heritage of an Anglican. You don't have to be an Anglican to be met by the Lord Jesus Christ, but I am an Anglican, and he met me as an Anglican. Now, that is my Sa Samson's long hair secret that Delilah wanted to get rid of, and she did. But for me, the reason why I have still stood my ground in Christ is because I came into touch with the living power of God in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And I will still run strong, and I told Jesus Christ, keep me working, keep me feeding the flock until my dying day. And I have trusted God to answer that prayer for me. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. Why don't you look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 6 to verse 8. Acts is after John. When you get over to John, the next book is Acts. And we're looking at chapter 1, and we want to read verse 6. This is the word of God. 
Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before them, their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. That is Jesus of Nazareth. He had taught his disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your kingdom come. So now he had been resurrected from the dead, and now he defeated death. He had paid for my sin on the cross. Now what next? Will the kingdom come? Because we must stop praying, your kingdom come, which you taught us. And he said, that's not my business. That is a father's business. That is why you are still praying, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth that is being done in heaven. We're still going to pray. We shall continue praying. But for now, what I want you to know is that the Holy Spirit will come. And you will receive power. Power not to study theological college and get a PhD. Power not to be ordained necessarily like me here. Power not to be a theologian, for instance. But power to be a witness. A witness is one who saw and heard. A witness is one who saw and heard. Be my witnesses to what you have seen and heard. Start in your Jerusalem. Go to all Judea. Go to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Power. Now you have to start from the starting point. The spirit had been given during Old Testament times for particular calling, for particular reasons. But let me not go into the Old Testament. Let me start with Jesus. He received the Holy Spirit to serve. He said these words. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a sacrifice to all. That's Matthew 20, 28. He came not to be served. Jesus was not a high table man, no. When I was a bishop, when I was archdeacon, when I was archbishop, mine was high table. Then I retired. Now when you retire, the question of being high table becomes very questionable. But because I am a preacher, I am still a high table guy. But Jesus Christ did not come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life as a sacrifice to all. So he came to serve, but he needed the Holy Spirit. And that is why when he was ready to serve, according to Luke chapter 3, verse 21 to 22, he went to John the Baptist to be baptized. He went to identify himself with the baptism of repentance, which he did not need. He did not need but he wanted to be part of us because he was born a human, he grew a human, and he died a human. And because he wanted to be with us and for us, he went into that water. Great things happened. The son was being baptized. The Holy Spirit came in bodily form like a dove. And the father spoke. And the father spoke. He said, you are my son whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. You're my son whom I love. In you, I'm well pleased. If you thought about Trinitarian God, that's where you see them come together. The son is in the water, the Holy Spirit coming at a dove, and then the father speaking from above because heaven was rendered and rendered open and things were happening at that time. Now, soon as he was baptized, Matthew picks it up in chapter 4 that the Spirit took Jesus to the desert, to the wilderness. Jesus did not go by himself to the wilderness. The Spirit took Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted. Elijah went to the wilderness. Paul went to the wilderness. Moses went to the wilderness. And so he was going to the wilderness. Then it was believed that the wilderness was the home of demonic forces. So he went to their own territory, to their own place to combat, to launch a war. For 40 days, he fasted, he prayed. Then after 40 days, 
the enemy came. He was tired, he was weak, he was hungry, he was malnourished. I hear people fast for 40 days, some people for 30 days, some other people 120 days. I don't know what kind of fast you do. But I believe Jesus Christ did not eat, but he drank. Where would he get water in the wilderness? Don't ask me because they don't tell me here. Satan is going to tempt him three times. The first temptation is about food. If you are the son of God, turn this stone to become bread. And he told Satan, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is a repeat of the first man called Adam, who was also tempted on food. Through his wife, pick that fruit and you will have the knowledge of good and evil. And you will be like God. Now that is temptation. The first man failed. The second man, the old serpent came back to him. Now as if that was not enough, he took him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he told him, throw yourself down. He had heard Jesus quote a scripture. He also quoted a scripture. Because it is written, God will send his angels and will hold you up so that they don't dash your feet to the soil. And Jesus said, it is also written, do not tempt the Lord your God. That's why you need to know scripture, friend. That's why you need to understand scripture, know scripture and know how to use it. Having a gun is one thing, knowing how to use a gun is another. Carrying a Bible either in a written form like this or in your tablet or in your iPad or in your phone is one thing. Knowing it is another and then using it is the final thing. He never gave up. He took him on a very high mountain and he showed him the glories and the riches and the wealth and the fame, everything else. Then he made a mistake. This is what he said. Fall down before me and worship me, and I'll give you all this. Now he crossed the red line. Now that, that was a very serious statement. Jesus said, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only will you serve. Luke tells us, Satan left him for an opportune time, meaning he's going to come back. And he kept coming back. He kept coming back. Now, for me, I saw why Jesus overcame Satan. He overcame Satan because of the power of the word fired by the Spirit of God. Now, when you know the word, when you understand the word, David would say these words, how can a young man keep his way pure? The answer is simple, by guarding it according to your word. And he continues to say, I have kept your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. And when the word of God is welling in your heart and you can use it appropriately, something happens. So he came back to his own town of Nazareth. Luke picks it up again in chapter 4 and verse 16 to 20. He was given the scroll of Isaiah to read. And he's going to read these words. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me. He has anointed me. Now having been filled in the, in the river by the Holy Spirit. And then went and faced the enemy and defeated him. Now he is coming to declare his manifesto. His manifesto. Very soon maybe next year or year after that we shall be hearing parties. Talking about manifesto, Jesus had a manifesto. If you are married, you also had a manifesto. Your manifesto was your vow. When you made your vow to your wife, by the way, I've, I've preached too many times over marriages, and I discovered that women actually don't make vows. Women repeat the vows that men make. Because I was still waiting for a service when the woman can start making vows. It has never come. The vows belong to me. Phoebe, I give you this ring as a sign of a marriage. I'm telling her, this is my manifesto. With my body, I honor you. 
And all I'm saying to Mama Phoebe now, she's no longer Phoebe, she's Mama Phoebe. She has got four children, and she has got four grandchildren, so she's a Mama Phoebe. I'm telling her, or then I, I told her, with my body, I honor you. And all I'm saying to her is from now on till death, no other woman will see my nakedness except you. With my body, I honor you. All that I am, body, soul, and spirit, I give to you. And all that I have, I don't give to you. I share with you. Within the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the church says, Amen. Amen. Now that is a manifesto. Jesus' manifesto began with, I am anointed to proclaim good news to the poor. I am anointed to proclaim good news to the poor. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of God belongs to them. Now, unless you are desperate for God, you can never be satisfied. Unless you are desperate for God, you can never search the word. Unless you are desperate for God, your prayer life can be very shallow. There has to be a hunger inside for God. There has to be a deep desire. In Psalms 41, 1 and 2, David is talking about, uh, has a dear pants for living waters. Has a dear pants for living st streams. I have a longing for you. Where can, when can I meet you again? Now, beloved, may God give you that hunger. Because if you hunger after his kingdom and after his righteousness, everything follows you. I'm talking about everything follows you. But because men and women don't hunger for the first thing and for the primary thing, they hunger for the secondary, they can't get them. And even if they get them, it doesn't satisfy them. If you are there on Monday, you heard me talk about it. Secondly, to proclaim king freedom for the prisoners. To proclaim freedom for the prisoners. I want you to remember there was a man in Luke chapter 8, verses 30 to 31. There was a man who Jesus decided to cross the lake of Galilee up to the other side specifically for him. And in his attempt to go across, the devil took charge. He brought a storm on the Sea of Galilee. And he wanted to swallow Jesus up. And the disciples were quaking and afraid, and he was asleep. When he stood up, he took charge, and he spoke to the wind, and he spoke to the raging waters, because they were stopping him from going to meet this guy out there. All was calm, and as soon as he crossed there, lo and behold, a man came to him, a man who was naked, a man who was living among tombs, a man who was less than a human being and no personality of any kind because Jesus was confronting the ones in him. He asked him, what is your name? He did not even know his name. He only knew the number. He said, I am legion, a prisoner. Do you know, I'm very interested about something. Let me tell you something. When I go to prisons and I look at inmates, and then I look at soldiers, perhaps even police. They have their names here. Then I look at inmates. They have number. One day I asked one of their people, he said, why do you number people and not give them names? He said, so that we can hide their identity. The devil took away the identity of this man. The devil took control of this man. The devil robbed him of his bed, put him among tombs. The devil gave stones to cut himself. The devil took away all his clothing and he was naked. And I told you on Monday, God hates nakedness. But the devil is always working upon stripping us of any covering like he did for Adam and Eve in the garden. And Jesus drove out those demons and the man came back and got back his name and he was dressed up again. <laughs> that is freedom for the prisoners. And not only that, recovery of sight for the blind is number three. That is his manifesto number three. He came as the light of the world. And he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever comes to me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
I am the light of the world. Whoever comes to me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so when you are in Jesus, you are going to walk in the light. Thank God for the Tukutene Rezo Revival, my friends. They knew how to walk in the light. They knew how to open their hearts to one another. The man would open his heart to his wife. His wife saw exactly what was going on there. And the wife would do the same. They repented and they repented. There was one guy who had put his neighbor's wife on bed and committed adultery and he got saved. He went back to the husband, the neighbor, and he confessed exactly what happened. And then he surrendered himself to this man. He said, now you can do what you like with me. Jesus arrested me and saved me. Now that is repentance and restitution. You remember the guy called Zacchaeus who had stolen left, right, and center? He was wallowing in wealth because of things he was stealing. But Jesus Christ decided to go and eat his food. And I'm always amazed because this food, possibly was even bought with stolen money. The table at which he said, possibly we are even bought with, with stolen money. Maybe even the house. But Jesus wasn't interested in what he had. He was interested in him. And because he ate his food, this man never had a sermon. The sermon was eating food. Suddenly got up. He said, look, Lord, half my property I'll give to the poor. Half my property I'll give to the poor. The guy had never had in his vocabulary giving. What he had was taking and getting. Now when Jesus came into his home, he began to understand giving. And then he said, if I cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times as a Jew. I want to come back to my original uh, roots. And Jesus declared, salvation has come to this house. For this too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. You get that in Luke chapter 19. Read from verse 1 up to 10. You get that amazing story of Jesus, the friend of sinners. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to to carry. What a privilege to go to him. Everything take to him in prayer. And here is Jesus Christ releasing this man who was blind in John chapter, chapter 9 verse 3 and Jesus Christ the light of the world to open the eyes of those who are blind. You may see now, even assisted by glasses like this, but unless revelation come to you, you can never see the mind of God. You can never understand what God is up to. Recovery of sight to the blind. And then fourthly, to set the oppressed free. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all of you who labor and are heavy laden. I will set you free. I will take away your burden. I will take away your struggle. I will take away that which weighs you down. And he came to set us free. Friends, if or not for Jesus Christ, some of us could have been eaten up by drugs because I was a drug. I went into bangi. I went into petrol sniffing. I was a young boy. I didn't even understand, but I wanted to be high. Then I came into alcohol. I came into the alcohol in Lira, where my brother there comes from. There is a level which is called Lira Lira. That one, you can strike a match, it will burn blue. I drank that stuff and I could not get drunk. My uncle who was hosting me had to send me home. He said, you are finishing my money. What kind of boy are you? Cannot even get drunk? Friends, it would have drunk me. It would have killed me long time ago, except for Jesus Christ. He delivered me so that even today I can speak to you the word of hope. That message which gives you transformation. I bless his holy name. I was set free. And then finally, number five, his manifesto says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the jubilee, where there is freedom, where we are set free. Let me again quote you Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. He says, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I am gentle and, and humble, and your souls will find rest. Oh, you are struggling. You are tired. You are disgusted with life. Things are not adding up. Take the rest from him. Take his yoke upon you. 
Walk with him, he's a good teacher. He knows your speed limit, he'll walk with you. He knows your weaknesses, he will understand. He will know how to bring you back. He will know how to always bring you back. Take my yoke upon you, the year of Jubilee. And he came to fulfill these scriptures. It is Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 3. When you go there, you read the full text of what he was reading in the synagogue in Nazareth. Jesus Christ needed the Holy Spirit in order to declare his manifesto. And for the three years, exactly what he declared would do, he did them. In the presence of his disciples who watched him. Now I was looking at the disciples. There are 12 of them. Beginning from Peter up to Judas Iscariot. And I was looking at each one of them. Then I found there's just one disciple in the gospel, there are so many things about him. His name is Simon. Simon, later on baptized Peter. I want us to look at Simon, a man among men, a very seasoned, weathered guy, the understanding of patience he knew because he was a fisherman, fishing at night. He knows what it means to be discouraged because someday he never got anything. Other days he would get something. A, a very, very, I think he was a kanyama of those days. A fisherman. I want you to look at him and I want you to know that God takes one like Simon who is also like you. And God can begin to transform a person, the kind of Simon, and I have a few things about him which I want to look at, and there are only eight. Number one, he was a fisherman. He was not a priest. He was not even a prophet. He was a fisherman. And Jesus zeroed on him. His brother was Andrew. His colleagues were John and James. They were all Galilean by Capernaum, in the Capernaum. He was a, 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 a fisherman. Now, I find Jesus extremely amazing. When things happened, and they caught a, a large number of fish, and he said, go away from me, Lord, because I'm a sinner. He said, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing men instead of fish. Now, it will take a miracle to turn a fisherman into a shepherd. It will take a miracle. It will take transformation. I'm told the Bahima don't eat fish. So there is nothing common between a shabwe and fish. <laughs> now this guy is a fisherman. And Jesus is asking him to come and follow him. We are told he left everything and followed him. Secondly, he was an ordinary, unschooled man. No certificate, no diploma, no degree. Acts chapter 4 verse 13 will tell you that. He was unschooled. He didn't have qualification the world would recognize. But Jesus needed him. Jesus needed him. Now, does Jesus need semi-literate? No, 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 no. Because Paul was a first-class theologian and a great writer. Jesus pulled him also in. But let's look at Peter. Thirdly, when he caught a lot of fish I've just quoted, he saw God in Jesus. He saw God in Jesus. That's Luke chapter 5, verse 6 to 8. He cried. He said, go away from me, for I'm a sinner. Go away from me, for I'm a sinner. He looked at God in Jesus. He looked at himself as Simon, and he knew he fell so low the standard. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the standard of God anyway. And there's no one righteous before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If you want to ask, ask Isaiah. Ask Isaiah. He was given a vision of the Lord seated on a throne, lifted and exalted high. And there were great angels called seraphim. These are flaming fires. And they were calling to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole, the whole earth is full of his glory. And he looked at that God, and he looked at that glory, and he looked at that power. The voices of these angels were shaking everything. The foundation, the doorpost of the temple, Isaiah said, I'm gone. Now, until you encounter the God who sends terror in you, it's very easy to take him for granted. Sometimes you come into his sanctuary here and your phone is on. Sometimes you are texting. When you are in the church, my friend, be a Muslim for one. They leave their, their shoes out there. And they walk in here without shoes on their feet. But if you take God for granted, God will take you for granted as well. 
But if you worship God, God will show you who you are and what mission he has got for you. Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Fourthly, we came to understand. We didn't know about other disciples. We came to understand he had a wife because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. In Luke chapter 4, verse 38 to 39, Jesus healed his mother-in-law. So he was a married fellow. Fifthly, Jesus at some point asked them, he said, what do people say I am? Who am I to other people? Give me public opinion about me. He said, uh, some people say you are John the Baptist. And other people said you are a prophet or Elijah. They gave about people who were mouthpiece of God. Then he turned around to them and he said, and who do you say I am? Now, if I ask you, when I was an archbishop, I was your bishop here for nine years. If you were here by 2004 up to 2012, they could ask you, said, who is Bishop Oromi, for instance? You can say something about me, about me. But if you want to know me better, talk to my children. They'll say something about their father, but if you really want to know me better, talk to my wife. She will tell you what I am a lot more than the children, but if you really want to know and you are really serious, you ask God. I'm looking at Simon Peter here, confessing Jesus as God's Messiah. God's Messiah. Luke chapter 9, verse 18 to 20. You are God's Messiah. He could see by the Spirit that this is no ordinary man born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth and is going to die in Jerusalem. No, this is a different man. You are God's Messiah. That is Simon Peter confessing Jesus in chapter in number six point. Jesus then baptized him, Peter, Petra, the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter, you are going to stand and you're going to stand tall. You're going to stand like a rock and I will build my church on you. Hence, the Catholic Roman will tell you the first pope was Peter because Jesus built the church on him. We don't know about that. But in Matthew 16, 18, it talks about Peter the rock. And then seven, this is the same man who denied Jesus three times. But he also wanted to defend Jesus, you will remember. Then when they arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he took a sword and he cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. His name was Malchus. And Jesus said to him, put back the sword. We are not here for fighting. He put, put I don't know whether it fell down, it was hanging by the skin. He put it back. Whoever takes the sword will die by the sword. If it was warfare, a word alone would command legions of angels in heaven. And we don't even need legions. Just one is enough for these few fellows who look like gods. So it's not for fighting. And Peter froze in his heart. I've denied Jesus because now Jesus wasn't fighting anymore. And he went into the courtyard and he was warming himself. And one person after another came to challenge him. He, he even on oath said, I do not know this guy. After three years of walking with him, Peter, I don't know him. But beloved, things will happen to Peter. Because after resurrection, this is my number eight, he went back to Capernaum in John 21. He went back fishing with six other disciples, and they fished the whole night and caught nothing. Early morning, Jesus was at the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he called the friends, have you any fish? They said, no, no. What are you doing, Jesus? Jesus is saying, I'm following my friends. Once a friend, always a friend. No matter what you do, once you are Jesus' friend, he will never let you down. Have you, have you any fish? He said, no, we don't have fish. Then he commanded. He said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat. You will catch some. And they did. I don't know how, but they did. The creator of the water knows all the molecules of that water. 
He knows exactly how many fish is in that water, and he can easily command them to come by the boat on the right side of the boat. And when they threw their nets there, they enclosed 153 big fish. Look at the difference. Before resurrection, when he did the same miracle, the nets were breaking, they were calling other people to come. But in this miracle, John 21, the nets never broke. The fish were many, and the fish were big. Is there a secret there? So, John, who now knew in his spirit, that must be the Lord. He said to Peter, that's the Lord. And Peter, very impetuous, very impetuous and very impulsive, he had stripped for work, he put on his outer garment, he jumped into the water, the first person to get out there. And he found Jesus making breakfast. And it was bread and fish. And they ate that breakfast in silence. And then after breakfast, hallelujah to you, Jesus. You know how to calm down our fears. You know how to settle our nerves. You know how to cushion us before you can cut us like a surgeon. You know a surgeon will cushion you with some kind of anesthesia so that when he cuts you, you don't understand. He knew how to cushion them with a the breakfast. They were hungry. They were tired. Now the adrenaline has settled down and energy came back. Of the seven people, he singled out Peter, son of John, Simon. Do you love me more than all this? Men, do you love Jesus more than the gadgets that you have, more than the work that you are doing, more than the good time you do with other people, more than the big car you are driving, and perhaps the big house you want to build? Do you love him more than the other things of life? Simon said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He tells Simon, feed my lambs. Then he asks him the same question. Simon, son of John, he's not even asking him Peter. He's asking him Simon, do you love me? Lord, you, you know that I love you. He said, take care of my sheep. Then he asked him the third time. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know me. You know me in and out. I told you only God knows you. Your wife does not know you. Your parents do not know you. Your children do not know you. Even your best friend does not know you, but God knows you. God knows who you are. He told Jeremiah, before you are conceived in your mother's womb, I had already known you. And before you were born, I had already appointed you a prophet to the nation. God knows you deeper than you ever know yourself. You can never hide from the Lord. David cried in Psalms 139, where can I flee from your spirit? Where? And some of us try to hide. Yes, you can hide from your wife. You cannot hide from God. You can hide from your best friend, but you cannot hide from God. And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then he said to Peter, feed my sheep. It will take a miracle for a fisherman to become a shepherd who will tend the little ones who will look after the flock. Peter was not in that business. Peter was in a different business. I want, to, I want to make a promise to somebody that your time for transformation has come. You will never be the person you thought you are going to be or you were. God is going to turn around your life and make you into somebody that you have never thought you would be. Let me give my testimony. I went and trained to be a teacher and a primary school teacher and got a certificate which no longer exists. I wanted to be a motor vehicle mechanic. God said, no. Go into teaching. I was taken there by, by force by my father. Little did I know that I wasn't going to teach for more than four years. Little did I know that God was going to show me how he was going to accelerate promotion for me. I was a classroom teacher. I was a deputy headmaster. I was a headmaster in four years, and I resigned. I will accelerate you. So when I walked into a setting of a priest, I was a diocesan youth worker. I was an archdeacon. I was a bishop. I was an archbishop. And some of you said, why did you retire early? I had finished. <laughs> and there was no more promotion, so why waste time? And I was the youngest bishop candidate. 
I was also the youngest Archbishop candidate, accelerated promotion. May the Lord accelerate you as well. May the Lord lift you rapidly to where he wants you to go. Even if you are an old man, may the Lord give you wings to fly. And that is why, beloved, I am still running strong as a retired guy. But I keep telling him, please don't accelerate this one. Just let me go slowly at this one here. March 27th, I had a crisis. You heard about it, and you prayed about it. I passed out. At 8 o'clock, I did not know who I was. My wife panicked. Everybody went on attention, including the president of this country was on alert. They made sure they airlifted me from my village up to Kololo. When I got to Kololo, I woke up. I told them, can you put the umbrella properly on me? Because it was drizzling, actually. Can you put the umbrella properly on me? And can you please allow me to go for short call? I was taken to Nakasero here, and they tested me, examined every part of my body. I was normal. I was OK. I passed out without pain. I didn't have a fever. I didn't have malaria. I didn't have anything else. I came out without pain. By 7.45 in the morning, I was asking for breakfast, and my appetite was 100%. <laughs> Archbishop came at 11 o'clock with, with juice, this one little juice. I drank the whole thing, and I was still needing more. They kept asking me whether I was going to have lunch, and I told them what menu I wanted. My friend, the doctor, said, no, just let him go slow. We are testing him. <laughs> what happened? I'll tell you what happened. The church prayed. The church prayed. The church prayed. In my home, even drunkards pr prayed. Drunkards prayed. Drunkards were hard offering themselves to be killed by God, but not this man here. A madman also was praying the same prayer, better take me, not him. Not yet, not yet, not yet. It was only not a national prayer, it was a global prayer. Not yet, Lord, not yet, Lord, not yet, Lord. Now, that is why I believe that my retirement should not be accelerated yet. Peter now is going to face a challenge. We read the Acts chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. They wanted the kingdom to come, the Romans to be overthrown, all those sort of things they were waiting for. No, Jesus said, no, I am going to give you the promised power of the Holy Spirit so that you can walk so that you can reach out, so that you can extend my kingdom, so that you can change the world upside down. And now this is where I am going to concentrate as I come to wind this message. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, things happened. The whole story is in chapter 2. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, with all other disciples in the upper room, there were 120 they felt a rushing of wind sweeping through Jerusalem in the upper room. And they saw tongues of fire on each one of them. And then, friends, the Spirit of God filled them up. And they began to speak in tongues. When he met me, I did not see the fire. I did not have the wind experience. That was for Jerusalem upper room. But I had the tongues. Now, an Anglican trying to do tongues can be a very big exercise. But it was not my faking it. It was my doing. It was his doing. And that is when I was only 23, only one week married. I'm not even in a theological college. I was a teacher. And this is part of why the acceleration was coming up. And God was saying, I'm giving you a mighty assignment. And for somebody here, God is going to tonight give you a mighty assignment. 
Why did the tongue come on the day of Pentecost? The tongue came on the day of Pentecost to reverse the curse that was levied on mankind on the Tower of Babel. On the Tower of Babel, languages were confusing and they never understood each other. But then he reversed that curse on the day of Pentecost because everybody understood what these people were saying. But there were multiple tongues, understandable, understandable. And God was sitting, setting records right at this point. Peter was there, and he was so transformed. This man now, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, was bold, was courageous, not the guy who was running away from a, a, a woman. Are you not one of them? You're a Galilean? No, no, I don't know him. No, no, no longer that guy. The guy is like a lion. The guy's heart is bold. The guy is very courageous, and he declared a message. He declared a message. It is in that message that people ask, man, what should we do? He said, repent. Believe in Jesus Christ, be baptized, and you will receive the promise that has been given to your ancestors. And 3,000 souls came to Jesus. Now, I am sure in my heart that God will not take me to heaven yet, and I'm giving you the reason. Until I see a revival break loose on the Church of Uganda. Until this cathedral here, All Saints Cathedral, by the way, I come just one road below there to a small church called Living Word Assembly. I also preach there, by the way. Those guys are hungry. I don't see the hunger here. Those guys are hungry. They have notebooks and they have pens. And when I'm preaching, they are taking notes, they're taking notes. Maybe you are taking notes in your mind and your heart. But when I encountered the power, that was June the 10th. I, was got, I got married on June the 3rd when you go to Namugongo, me, I was, I was marrying. Then in August, I was invited to go to Gulu to speak to a group of young people in Scripture Union Day Conference. Over 500 of them were gathered together. The Lord gave me a message, John chapter 4, talking about the Samaritan woman. I preached for about an hour. When I finished and I made an altar call, 250 got up to receive Christ. I said, no, I don't think you understood. You sit down, first of all. I went step by step to explain what it means to surrender to Jesus Christ, and I asked them to stand up. The same number, including a Catholic nun, an American also got up to receive Jesus Christ. Now, I then learned I have the power to reach out in evangelistic ministry. From then on, it has never stopped. Amen. Then other gifts begin to come up. Some of the gifts in you are lying dormant. It is a spirit of God tonight who will activate it for you. Amen. The release only comes when we yield to the spirit of God. The moment you yield to the spirit of God, somebody asked me when I was preaching somewhere in Arua, he said to me, Bishop, why do you still preach like you were preaching 10 years ago? I told him, I'm connected to the source of power. And so I recharge my battery every day. And my battery is always full. Pity him who does not connect to the socket and cannot recharge. That's why many of us fall by the roadside. Our batteries are flat, no strength. We face issues we can't manage. Get plugged. Get plugged into him who will keep you going day in, day out, every year until he calls you home to put a crown on, the, on your head. Now, let, let, me, let me now look at Peter as I look at you. May God release in you. May God release a mighty anointing in your life. May the Lord open up the floodgates for you so that you understand who the Spirit is and what he wants to do with you as an individual. Now, the anointing that comes on you is so that you can witness without fear of men. Much of our witnessing fails because we are fearing men's opinion. What will they say about me? I'm justice so-and-so, I'm counsel so-and-so, I'm a big businessman. What will they say about me? You mean your self-estimate by people's opinion is anything before God? No. The approval comes from God. Let God be the one to approve you, and you will be riding higher than the clouds. 
So you are anointed to witness without fear. Peter did that. And you will witness to your family. Now the most difficult area to witness to is family. They know you from A to Z plus. Witness to your neighbor. Witness to your neighbor. You're not preaching. You are telling them who Jesus is to you and what he has done to you. Witness to your workmates. Witness to strangers. Witness to rulers. Because that would be your area of jurisdiction when he gives it to you. Secondly, the anointing will come so that you understand scriptures. That when you read, you understand. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 17, tells us that the author of the scriptures is the Holy Spirit. So consult the author for understanding. Ask him to help you to understand. Thirdly, the Spirit helps you to pray, to pray meaningfully. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, Paul says, we do not know what to pray for. I have a feeling somebody will come to the prayer mountain in Nebi. When you come to the prayer mountain in Nebi, your prayer life changes. Because right now, you start with you and you end with you. It's all about you, about your family, about your friends, about your work, about your economy, about what is happening to you and to you and to you and to you. The moment you come to the prayer mountain in Nebi, there are 10 points and you are praying for every other thing until the last point when you pray for yourself. He opens up the door for you. He opens up what you should pray for. Then when you are anointed, you will overcome temptation. You will overcome temptation. Temptation is not sinning. It's not bad to be tempted. But when we yield to temptation, we sin. Listen, Adam was only given one rule and he failed. One temptation, eat that you'll become like God as if he did not know God said, I want to make him like us. Now he has failed. Jesus was tempted three times. He never ever sinned. The secret, the spirit of God. Amen. Now are you asking me, didn't Adam have the spirit of God? Of course God breathed life into him. But it's up to him to submit to him, which he did it. It was disobedience. It will help you to live a holy life, consecrated, set apart, surrendered life. Is it possible to be living a holy life? Now, holiness, holiness doesn't mean sinlessness, no. It means you are consecrated, set apart, and surrendered. And the life you live, you live by faith in him who died for you. You have been crucified with him. So your life is no longer your life. Your life is his life in you. And when you live knowing that Christ in you is your hope of glory, then you are going to walk with a single mind to please God. The Holy Spirit will also convict you in order to repent. Amen. Conviction comes from above and is the one who convicts you. And then may I ask you, beloved, I'm finishing now. May I ask you, please, ask God, let him anoint you. Let him anoint you. I ask him. My wife also asked him. We received because when you ask, you receive. When you seek, you find. When you knock, the door will be open. For everyone who asks to receive, a he who seeks finds. And the door will be open to whoever is knocking. What father among you? If his sons ask for bread, will give a stone. Or ask for fish, will give a snake. Or ask for an egg, will give a scorpion. Jesus said, evil as you are, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You ask him tonight. Ask him, say, Lord, I surrender. Come into my life. Take my life. Empower me and allow me to be the person that will execute the kingdom purposes. Please, please, beloved, never grieve him. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't make him sad by your way of life. And then I want to read this scripture, then I'm going to ask Jaffa to come here. This scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Listen to this scripture. Paul is at pain to help us to understand who we are. And I'm going to ask you to follow from verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit 
who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. Beloved, you are not your own. You have been bought at a price. He paid for you not in silver and gold, diamond, rubies. It was his own life for your own life. Things which cannot be bought, things which cannot be purchased, he paid for you, he paid for me. We don't belong to ourselves, we belong to him because he paid the price tag for us. Therefore, listen to this, therefore, honor God with your bodies. Honor God with your bodies. Jaffa, come over here. Lord, I see an anointing on this young man. I want to ask you to saturate his mind and his heart and his life, making him a tool in your hand so that he can execute the purposes of the kingdom of God in this cathedral as he assists the provost. Jesus Christ, I also saw that you are weeping for your church. You are weeping for the darkness your church is in. You are weeping for the laxity and compromising spirit your church is in. You are weeping for the weaknesses of your people. Tonight, you want to pour your power. You want to pour your anointing. You want to transform people. You want to show people a direction. Let this young man be a voice. Let this young man have a prophetic ministry in him. Let this young man understand the deep, deep things unsearchable from God. So that as you use him, use his voice full of anointing. As he stands tall, allow him to be a giant in the faith. And as he calls people to come for salvation and to be filled by the Spirit, may the words come out with love and power and favor that many people will turn to you and be refreshed by the Spirit of God. Going back home knowing it has happened to me. I bless him, Lord God. I bless the provost. I bless everybody seated here and in the tent. And I ask you to hold them tight because you love them. In Jesus' mighty name, and the church say, Amen and Amen. I have transferred the anointing in me, this guy. And I want him to call you to come and meet your Savior and connect with your God. Jaffa. I surrender all to you. Everything, Lord. Everything. Can you just rise up on your feet? Lord, I surrender. I surrender all to you. Everything, Lord. Everything. I give to you, Lord. I surrender. I surrender all to you. Everything, Lord. Everything I give to you. Sing with holding nothing. With holding nothing. With all. your two hands lifted in the air as a sign of surrender. It is at the point of surrender that you can receive. It's at the point of surrender that the anointing came upon Peter. He surrendered his boat to Jesus. He surrendered his business. 
He surrendered his life. He's at the point of surrender you can receive. Any man that wants to receive, he comes in a bent position. If you come from a higher position, if you come with pride, you cannot fetch any water from the tap. The tap will be open. The water will be flowing. But once your cup is lifted in the air, you cannot receive. The position you take is to bend. I want every man, every woman that is here that really want to receive. Some of you are going through various temptations. Some of you are going through trials. But the Holy Spirit is going to touch you. And from this very moment, like our Father declared right here, your life will change. Some of you are going to have an experience of visions. Some of you, your eyes will open up. You begin to see things in the spirit. You begin to see the, a new dimension that you have never known God before. This same God you have despised, the word you have despised, you begin to tremble at the presence of the Lord. When he shows up to you, you become a different man. The Bible says that when John saw him, he fell as dead. He fell as dead. No man has an encounter with the Holy Spirit and remains the same. If you have lustful thoughts, if you have thoughts of the flesh, if Satan has taken you to that very deep, deep bottom hole to take you for a ride, the Lord can reverse anything that the enemy has done. And now as the Lord the gift of life, the Holy Spirit, who God has given to those who obey Him, moves in this place. Let every impurity be cleansed. As I pray from here, the Holy Spirit will begin to move in your midst. He'll begin to touch those who are ready. He'll begin to touch those who are impure and for some of you you are already experiencing that shaking when it touches you you will know when it touches you you will know when it touches you you will know when it touches your soul you will know father they are ready. Let the fire, the tongues of fire, the tongues of transformation. The Bible says those tongues rested on each one of them. Let those tongues rest on each one of them that are hungry for you. Just lift up those hands. Some of you will receive the spirit of wisdom. Thank you, Lord. Let the ministry of the Holy Spirit begin to be activated. When he comes, he comes with gifts. When he comes, he comes to break chains. When he comes, he shakes every establishment. The plants that Satan had planted will be rooted out. The pride that Satan had planted will be rooted out. Father, now touch your servants, whatever they are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's an anointing right in the middle there. When it comes upon you, some of you will receive. They are various gifts and they are meant to equip the church, the body of Christ. They are utterance gifts. They are gifts of power. And they are revelational gifts. Just close your eyes. Father, in the name of Jesus, I now pray 
that as your servants receive let every gift you wanted to release today begin to be released now thank you Lord thank you Lord yes thank you Lord Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There's a gift of healing coming upon you. The glory of God Almighty, the living God, is touching you now. Is touching you now. Father, break the realm of limitation. Break the realm of limitation in their lives in the name of Jesus let the supernatural jacket that supernatural clothing the Bible says you shall be clothed with power from on high Holy Ghost fill them Thank you, Lord. Fill them an anointing that breaks the yoke. You shall touch the sick. The sick will get healed. Thank you, Father. You shall touch the sick. The sick will get healed. Tumors will be brought down in the name of Jesus. Let the super... I see a person receiving the supernatural jacket. The supernatural explosion. Something is going to explode in your life. And it's a gift from the Father. It's a gift from the Father. It's a gift from the Father. It's a gift from our Father. Oh, thank you, Lord. I see a person receiving utterance gifts. Anything that comes on your mouth, just speak it. That's the gift of tongues. That's the gift of tongues. Anything that comes upon your mouth, just speak it. Let new prophetic oil, the mantle of prophecy, the mantle of new oil fall upon you. Take charge, Lord. Take charge, Lord. Take charge, Lord. Let the old man, there's a person, they are removing the old man. The jacket you are putting on is filthy. They are putting you into another jacket. It's called the supernatural jacket. The clothing with the power from on high. Father, thank you. Glory, glory, glory everywhere. The living God. The God who gives wisdom. The Alpha and Omega is here. Holy Spirit. Begin to give them the gift of tongues the gifts of healing, the revelational gifts, gifts of prophecy, gifts that will change their families. When they go to minister, they shall never be the same. There's a person that is receiving the gifts of proclamation. You are going to stand. Boldness will fall upon you. Boldness. If you are ready, God is ready. That's how it works. Some of you are feeling a tingling on your fingers. Some of you are feeling a tingling right on top of your head. It's the Spirit of God. The Bible says those tongues rested upon them, on each one of them. Dear Holy Spirit, thank you for all the manifestations. You are in charge of the clothing. You are in charge of removing doubts you are in charge of manifestations that come upon a people you have created those who have been prayerless the Lord is granting you intercession the spirit of grace and supplication father empower a man to pray empower a lady to pray empower them to pray yes Yes, yes, yes. Wait for him, wait for him. 
empower a child to pray we end the season of prayerlessness in your life we end the season of laxity with the things of the spirit we end the season of laxity in prayer and fasting and seeking the face of the Lord let there be a new clothing in your life oh Jesus oh Jesus oh Jesus oh Jesus oh Jesus oh Jesus the atmosphere has changed oh Jesus let your glory fall let your glory fall let your glory fall let your glory fall and minister healing to so many that could be here let your glory fall and take over everything they have been doing thank you jesus thank you lord Eyes closed.